Hello everyone and uh, yes uh, I just want to remind you again our strong tower if you did not sign up please make sure you sign up for that and today is the third Sunday of the month and we have with us uh, Reverend Anthony Rogers but before he starts I just want to give you some announcements we are in the Detroit area uh, not Anthony but uh, he is coming soon uh, uh, you driving tomorrow or uh, yeah, tomorrow evening. You want everybody to know I'm on the road so they can uh, they can intercept me? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, may the Lord protect you, brother. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, we are in the Detroit area. We have a full schedule of outreaches. And uh, yes, we would love to see you if you are locally here. Join us. And... Uh, and uh, training, VBS, door-to-door um, -door outreach, and uh, also the festival outreach. Uh, we rented a big tent where uh, we're going to be at the festival in Detroit area. Uh, thousands of uh, Arabs and Muslims will be there. And last year, we have a wonderful time. Please uh, pray for us. We need your prayers. And if you need to know more details, please don't hesitate to text message me. My cell phone number is in the website. And we would love to see you if you are able to come and join us. Uh, you have to be a born-again Christian. You have to be a team player that you're willing to work under other authorities and, and willing to work with each other um, for the way that we are doing it. Um, is to reach out to Muslims one on one. Is I, I love reaching Muslims online, and that's why we are training people online to reach out to Muslims. But when we are facing Muslims face to face, uh, it's not about the YouTube, it's not about the internet, it's about reaching that individual in front of us. And no matter uh, what opportunities can give us online to have this footage, we prefer not. Uh, we had so many outreaches during the year that we prefer not to put these videos online because of the sake of the gospel, because we want to see these people turning around and following Jesus as the Lord and Savior. I'm not saying that if you, uh, if you don't put it on, if you, we put it online, we are not going to use it with other people's lives. Yes, absolutely. Uh, other Muslims can listen to it and can come to Christ as well. But when we are in a mission trip, our purpose, we are there, is to reach that individuals that we're going to face to face talk to. Um, please pray for us and uh, may God use us in a powerful way. We're going to be getting a lot of gospel material out and conversations and engaging in debates with them. But the only one can change the heart is the work of the Holy Spirit. Is God drawing them to himself. It's not us. It's, uh, that's why we need your prayers. Um, Reverend Anthony, today is a very interesting topic. What is it? <laughs> Oops, sorry. I had myself muted. No problem. Uh, yeah, so I have the title on my page. It's on Samuel Zwamer. Today will be an introduction to the life and works of the great missionary Samuel Zwamer. I'll explain more where I intend to go with this at the end, but for now, that's that's the basic idea. Looking at one of the great missionary giants of the past towards the Muslims. Awesome. Uh, I'm sure every one of you knows Anthony, but Anthony, if someone doesn't know you in, is in our channel, I know we are live in your channel as well. Uh, how can they, uh, what is your channel? Anthony yeah, my Rogers. channel, my channel is just under my name, Anthony Rogers on the channel. I sometimes discuss Islam. Of course, every third Sunday, these episodes go up on my channel, as you just mentioned. And sometimes I put other things, but most of the time on my channel, I'm usually just, uh, expounding on some passage of scripture or looking at some biblical doctrine maybe here and there i've got a debate in fact just the other day i did a debate on the deity of christ which will probably go on the channel at some point so the the channel is not limited to islam and, and part of that is precisely because i'm aiming to inform christians and build them up so they can be better servants of christ not only to muslims but to others 
uh, but also uh, because when we evangelize Muslims, the goal is not in the name of the, uh, you know, the, the nature of the case, the name is to evangelize, right? And so we're not only refuting Islam, we're proclaiming Christ to them. We want to see them come to the Lord Jesus. At the end of the day, if we tear down Islam, but we don't present Christ to them, then we've not done our Christian duty. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's always awesome to have you with us, brother. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, it is yours. If you need anything, please uh, holler. <laughs> okay, brother. Okay. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking at a different conference up in Ohio. In fact, I just saw L here a moment ago. And uh, I was at the church where they organized an event, and I was asked to preach on discipleship, the importance of it. And so I chose as my primary text the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That, of course, is the text where Jesus, consequent upon his resurrection, said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So the central command there uh, of Jesus issued on his absolute authority. Remember, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The, the central command is to go and make disciples which presupposes, it's a package deal, it presupposes that the gospel has been preached and that people have been convicted and converted. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 10, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith is alien to us, according to Paul. It's not natural to us. It comes. Faith comes. It's a gift from God. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, Philippians 1, 29. Numerous texts speak to this. Faith being a gift is, is something that comes to us, and the means that God uses to work faith in the heart is the preaching of the gospel. So through the preaching of the word, God brings people to himself, and through that same word being preached and taught, people are built up and made disciples of the Lord Jesus. They come to do all that he commanded, and the, the great assurance there in that text is that Jesus is with us. This is a momentous task, not one that any individual or even any group, even throughout multiple generations, could hope to fulfill were it not for that promise of Christ annexed to the command. This promise being added or annexed to the command assures us of success. And so uh, I, I preached on that text a couple of weeks ago, and it also, these are all providential things. I didn't determine to address that topic. I was asked to address it. Uh, but I also am concluding at a church that I'm preaching at what in an interim period there without a pastor. So I've been preaching for a while there and I'm concluding one book and deciding on where I'm going to go from here. And I, I decided to start preaching through the book of acts. And so today was the uh, first day I, I kind of broached it. I'm not quite finished with the other book, but I, I broached it just to whet their appetites and I looked at the first eight verses of the book of Acts, and of course, the whole thing is about how Jesus is going to pour out the Spirit upon his church, and that is going to enable them to go and preach the gospel and make disciples among all nations. In fact, uh, Luke reminds the readers of what he said at the beginning of his gospel when he, on the, the lips of uh, John the Baptist, tells us that the, the baptism of John was a preparatory baptism, and it pointed to the greater individual, Jesus, greater than John, and the greater work that he was going to accomplish. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but one's coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, in Acts chapter 1, Luke picks that up again and tells us that Jesus reminded the disciples of this, and he, he told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they received the Spirit, and then they would receive power to become his witnesses in uh, 
Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, as I'm thinking about this, so I preached that sermon on Matthew 28, the Great Commission, and then I was preaching on Acts 1. I I've been thinking much about the evangelistic efforts of Christians, the evangelistic effort of the church. So uh, the efforts of individuals and the effort of the corporate body. And one of the things that struck me repeatedly is just how huge this task is. And at the same time, how heroic the efforts of certain Christians have been, which ought to be uh, inspiring to us. Now, before I come to Samuel Zoimer, I want to remind you something about uh, the importance of history. If you've studied history, especially if you've studied anything on church history, then you've probably heard the statement of Edmund Burke. He once said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. In so saying this, Burke was pointing up something of the importance of studying history. Uh, from history, we, we learn of past mistakes and errors. That's what Burke had in mind. And, and if we're wise, Burke is suggesting, then the knowledge of these mistakes will not be just information, but will serve as deterrence. The wise man learns and takes heed. But history isn't only full of bad examples. We also have good examples in church history. And so if it's the case that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat its mistakes, uh, the mistakes made by bad men and lamentably sometimes also by uh, good men, well, then it's also the case that a knowledge of the good things that people have done, especially those things done by men and women of faith, that can also serve as examples and inspiration for us. So uh, what I'm pointing out here is that we can learn from history, not only things to avoid mistakes not to fall into, but we can also learn positively and we can be inspired. Indeed, uh, I, I recommend that Christians make it a regular a part of their reading that they read about men and women of faith, read good biographies, especially uh, the works of Christians. This will ennoble you and and work in you a great zeal when you see the work of the Spirit at work in the church, at work in individuals. Well, uh, all of this, we don't need Burke to, to tell us, right? The prophets and apostles tell us the same thing long before Edmund Burke did. Scripture is replete with historical narrative, right? We have historical narrative in Genesis, in Exodus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Kings, many books of the Old Testament and also books of the New Testament, the Gospels, the book of Acts, even sometimes in the epistles, we get some narrative. So, for example, when Paul narrates what happened at Antioch when he faced off with Peter for not being a very good fake pope, uh, that's tongue in cheek, of course, Peter was no pope, there's no papal office, but uh, Peter shows that he was a fallible individual, and Paul uh, confronts him for his hypocrisy. So, so we have narrative throughout the Bible. And why is the Bible giving us these narratives? Is it just to fill our heads full of data, to give us facts, trivia, maybe so we can go on Jeopardy, maybe so we can look smart to people that quiz us and, and pass you know, these, these Bible trivia tests? Uh, obviously not. Uh, the, the, the goal of Scripture is that we be holy that we be like Christ. God is seeking to conform us to the image of Christ. That's the end goal. And so these narratives have to play some role in all of that. Well, uh, one example of scripture telling us this is exactly what these narratives are for is found in 1 Corinthians 10. There, Paul speaks of the Exodus generation and how it displeased God and how they were, as a consequence, laid low in the wilderness. Well, in, in that context, Paul said this. This is found in 1 Corinthians 10. He said, now these things happened. Note this. These things happened. What things? The Exodus generation, displeasing God and being laid low in the wilderness. These things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. So, yes, 
idolatry is forbidden in the New Testament, just like it was in the old. The new hasn't changed that. It's not now the case, as some erroneous groups tell us, that because of the incarnation, you can now have idols and icons. Paul, in the New Testament, says that was an example to us, these people succumbing to idolatry and being laid low in the wilderness. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. We shouldn't be surprised, by the way, this is an aside, uh, when we see these historical judgments take place precisely on groups that are given to this sort of thing. This is the, the way God acts in history. When people sin against him in a corporate way, it often uh, brings about uh, a swift judgment. So the, the author, the, 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 Paul, the apostle Paul says, don't let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. So both in verse six and in verse 10, Paul tells us that all of this was given as an example for us. These things are there to instruct us. Uh, I'm reminded of Romans four. You can check this out. I don't have it pulled up here, but in Romans four, it tells us about the, the faith of Abraham. And it says that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and so forth. And Paul, in the course of talking about Abraham's faith and, and so forth, said, this was not written for his sake alone, but for our sakes. A very significant text in, in a number of ways. Uh, I don't want to get distracted by it, though I'm tempted. But um, at least this much is clear. Paul's saying that was written for our benefit. So in the case of 1 Corinthians 10, we're being given a negative example. Don't do this. These people sinned against God and they paid the price for it. Uh, in the case of Abraham, we have a positive example. Uh, but, but listen to Romans 15, same epistle. So Paul in Romans 4 mentions Abraham, but listen to what Paul says in Romans 15. Here he gives us a, a positive uh, way of looking at history. He says, now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. So the, the point that Paul is laboring at here is that we need to bear the weaknesses of others. We're not simply to please ourselves, do that which makes us happy or, or gives us comfort. We're to try and do those things that please uh, others and help others in their weakness. He goes on to say, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself. So notice he mentions the example of Christ. But then he goes on to quote the Old Testament scriptures. As it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So he points to the example of Christ who lived among them. And then further than that, he points back to the Old Testament scriptures, which foretold these things and tells us how Christ received the reproaches that otherwise belonged to the Father. That is, Jesus is doing the Father's will. People are reproaching him for it, pretending, of course, that it's not uh, the Father's will that he do these things. And so Jesus, as a consequence, is seeking to please his Father, even though it brought discomfort upon him. But then Paul goes on to say this, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another, according to Jesus Christ, so that with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have in Scripture itself something of the importance of history. Of course, in Scripture, we have that history given to us by the inspiration of the Spirit, but 
that doesn't mean that we are not also to draw encouragement from other Christians in history. The Spirit hasn't stopped working in the lives of Christians. And moreover, we have the scriptures through which to view these things. The scriptures are like spectacles by which we can see clearly as we uh, evaluate people and events and so forth. So we can learn from Christians throughout the ages, not only those that are given to us in scripture. And, and you know, we have uh, the beginnings of this, of course, in scripture. You have uh, one of my uh, favorite texts uh, in, uh, I was reminded the other day that I say this often. I, every time I mention a text, I say one of my favorite texts, I, I guess uh, everything is a favorite text uh, any time it comes to mind, at least on the, the, the points that it's touching on. But uh, Hebrews 11, this is a, a text where the apostle is explaining what faith is. Throughout the epistle, he's writing to Hebrews, trying to deter them from going the way that the earlier Exodus generation went and others when they heard the good news preached to them but didn't mix what they heard with faith. Uh, they perished. It's the same point Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, he, he's writing to these Hebrew Christians, warning them not to make the same mistake, but to receive what they hear with faith. And then he gives many examples of faith. He talks about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and, Don, and, and down on. And, and then he, he goes on in, in chapter 12 to say this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance, endurance the race that's set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, so uh, all of this is a setup to what I want to talk about concerning uh, the great missionary Samuel. Uh, Zwamer. But uh, one of the things I want people to be thinking about as, as we get into this is uh, how all this sort of thing that I just talked about plays a role in how we ought to think in terms of carrying the gospel to others. Now, obviously, not every individual has called to be a missionary on the mission field. We've not all been called to leave uh, the, the place of our birth or uh, the, the place where we were brought up or where we currently live, we have callings. All these callings are from God, whatever they are. And, and uh, th th there's nothing uh, th that's sinful about a Christian not being on the mission field, unless, of course, they were called to it. At the same time, Scripture does teach that there's a sense in which everybody's a missionary, right? Not everybody's a foreign missionary, like Samuel Zwamer was. But everybody's called to be a witness for Christ in their own context. Everybody is called, first of all, if you're a parent, to be a evangelist to your children and a discipler to your children. Everybody is called in their neighborhoods, in their vocational context, to be a, a witness of Christ and in the ways that God uh, allows and the ways that God makes possible and with wisdom and so forth, everybody's called to be a missionary. And so when, when you think about what this involves and, and you're, you're thinking of it as you're looking back upon, upon these things, uh, these things should be a source of tremendous comfort to you because these are the sorts of things I'm, I'm going to talk to you about Zwamer and you're going to see this, this was a heroic individual. Uh, it, it's pretty incredible when you look at his life, and I'm I'm not going to be able to do it the, the the justice I think it deserves, but I'm going to do my best, and I, I think you'll see at least the beginnings of why this was is such a great uh, figure that God used. But uh, when when you look at the the task that you have in these respects, it's it's huge, right? Even getting one heart to change, first of all, is beyond us. We can plant and water, we sow the word and so forth, but it's God who gives the increase, Paul said. It, it's the Lord who opens the heart. And, and so, uh, but we're still called to, to do these things. And when we think of just what a impossible task it is for us to be uh, 
fruitful with even one sinner. And you know how much resistance people put up. It's, it's, uh, it, it can be quite daunting. And so what is it that would give one courage? And when you think about ministering to Muslims, well, here you've, you're, you're talking about a, a whole different nut, right? Uh, some nuts are harder to crack. Well, uh, Muslims are, are particularly hardened and blinded by the false religion of Islam. They're in the throes of Satan. And, and so when we go and labor among them, we can find this an especially daunting task. And, and how are we in this context to have the zeal, have the courage, have the conviction that we can do this, we can be successful? Well, keeping all of that in mind, let, let's think. Let's look at Samuel Zwamer here for for a little while. Well, one of the things that you'll see if you pick up anything on Samuel Zwamer, whether articles in periodicals, and there are many, uh, or encyclopedia entries, or even full scale biographies. Uh, one of the best, by the way, if you're interested in reading more about Zwamer later, is written by J. Christie Wilson Jr. I can't think of the exact title, but uh, J. Christie Wilson Jr. wrote what is considered the foremost biography on Zwamer. But one of the things that you'll see in all these different writings when people talk about Zwamer uh, is that he's regarded as one of the greatest missionaries to Muslims, in fact, uh, in all of history. But uh, uh, Kenneth Scott Latourette, who was one of the greatest historians, of missionary activity and the expansion of the church in history, uh, Kenneth Scott Latourette once said, no one, this is a direct quote, no one through all the centuries of Christian missions to Muslims has deserved better than Samuel Zwamer the designation of apostle to Islam. Now, don't misunderstand the use of the term apostle there. When Latourette speaks this way, he's not doing what some people in our day do, and people wanting high-sounding titles uh, pretend that they're an apostle, and so on the level of Peter and, and John and James, he's using this in a hyperbolic way. He's just saying, here is a man who was a giant of missionary activity, and so we euphemistically refer to him as the apostle to Islam. Okay? He did among the Muslims something that the apostles in their day did among uh, the people in Ephesus or in Galatia and so forth. So uh, Zwamer's uh, regard, according to Latourette, is that he deserves more than anybody else to be called the apostle to Islam. Now, at this point, you don't know why he's given such a high honor. Uh, and I can tell you, by the way, not only is it the case that Latourette considered this to be true in the case of Zwamer, uh, and that's already significant because, as I said, Latourette is one of the greatest his historians of, of missionary activity in the history of the church. But uh, I don't know any historian, missiologist, or biographer that disagrees with this assessment. Everybody thinks that Samuel Zwamer was a man that God used mightily, the likes of which among Muslims we haven't seen before or since. Though, uh, there's every reason to, to believe that God could still raise up and will raise up uh, uh, more mighty individuals like Zwamer. That's our prayer, right? In fact, uh, well, I'll tell you something about how Zwamer prayed frequently uh, in a moment. But um, what is it that earns Zwamer this reputation? Well, before proceeding to answer this question, I should point out that Zwamer certainly didn't seek this kind of notoriety. He, he wasn't clamoring for this high honor of being called the apostle to Islam or any other high honor. Okay, this sort of thing was as far from Zwamer's mind as the East is from the West. Okay, it, it's important, I think, to observe this at the present time because th that temptation is always present. Uh, but I think it's easier for people to fall into now that we have social media right? I, I'm doing this on YouTube. There's the ability for people to see this. Uh, a lot of what people were doing in the past on the mission field would go largely unnoticed, uh, although things would be written about it, and th there was always that potential. Um, now it's even greater in our day, right? And, and people can become distracted by that sort of thing. 
and, and this, so this is a is something we should learn from Zwemer. Zwemer's desire was to communicate the gospel. He makes this clear throughout his writings. His life bears this out. He was motivated by love for neighbor and love for the Lord. His goal was to bring Christ to sinners and glory to God. In fact, just to give you one bit of evidence for this, in his private journal, note his private journal, so this was something not intended for public notice, so you can be sure it reflects his genuine thoughts. This is what he wrote on March 17th in 1888. He said, Oh, may my life in the future be one of usefulness. I have prayed that God would consecrate me to the work of foreign missions. May my only motive be his honor and glory. Oh, how much we, meaning fallen sinners, seek our own glory instead of his. So, so Zwemer was praying to God and noting in his own private journal his desire to go out into the foreign missions field and that this would be his motive to honor and glorify the Lord. And of course, subsumed under that, bring sinners to Christ, build up Christ's church and so forth. But his, his highest goal was to bring glory to God. Now, there, there are many other things that uh, Zwemer said in his journal uh, that, that show you something of the, the, the spiritual character of the man. Uh, I'll, I'll read a few of these. Uh, this is from uh, February 6th, 1888. He, uh, he says, George Mueller's life. So he's reflecting on, uh, he's doing what we're doing now. We're, we're reflecting on the life of Zwemer. He's reflecting on the life of George Mueller, another man used mightily by God. He said, George Mueller's life of trust makes one feel the power of prayer. Why can we not all live in that way. Much prayer brings us near to God. So he's saying Mueller was a man of prayer. May that be true of all of us. M much prayer brings us near to God. Uh, later in another entry, he says, my Bible reading today was in Isaiah. Oh, that I might, might be touched with a coal from the altar and be able to speak the gospel with power. He's reflecting on the vision of Isaiah in Isaiah 6 when he saw the Lord and he struck with the knowledge of his sinfulness and, and his pitiable condition and he cries out in terror and then the Lord uh, has an angel touch his lips with, the, with a coal from the altar and proclaims him cleansed of his defilement. Uh, so Zwemer is praying for this to be true for him, not again for any fanfare, but so that he might be able to speak the gospel with power. Uh, many other things uh, can be seen in his journals that bespeak the, the character of the man, his piety, uh, the fact that he was dedicated to prayer, the fact that he was dedicated to Bible reading. In fact, many of them are all about his Bible readings. March 17th, he, uh, it says, read Romans. That's the only thing it says. Well, it does say, excellent logic, no book in the Bible like it. Uh, so that's, that's a very brief entry. Uh, in another entry, he said, I have resolved to spend one hour each day from 12 to 1 in prayer and Bible reading. So that was one of his resolutions. Every day uh, for at least an hour amidst all of his labors and everything else, not that he would only do it for an hour, but th the point was no matter what else is happening, at least this much will be certain he will give at least one hour every day to reading and prayer. So he was a, a very godly man. In fact, uh, he was raised in a godly home, his, this shows you something of the importance of providing a godly family, by the way. Uh, that's the, the, the first field of our evangelism, our missionary labors is among our own family. Well, his family was, uh, they were immigrants from the Netherlands, so they were Dutch reformed. They came over here to America and he was raised in a context where Bible reading was a regular thing. They read the Bible every day as a family at dinner and so forth. They sang hymns together. There was Bible memorization. Uh, there was prayer. They were all these things. These things conditioned his life. It was part of the atmosphere that he lived in. It was part of the air that he breathed. Uh, eventually, he decided that he wanted to go to school, not necessarily settled on exactly what he wanted to do at that point, but he, he decided he wanted to go to school and he went to a place called Hope College. When he, he went to Hope College, it was a, a Christian school, 
And while he was there, a man by the name of Rob, uh, Robert Wilder uh, visited the school and spoke about mission work. In fact, uh, I mentioned J. Christie Wilson uh, before. I want to read a section of an article that she wrote. So this is not from the book I mentioned a moment ago. This is from an article that she wrote called The Legacy of Samuel Zwamer. She says, during Samuel Zwamer's senior year at Hope College, Robert Wilder, a pioneer of the student volunteer movement, visited the campus. While he was presenting the needs of missions, he had a map of India on display with a metronome in front of it. So uh, a metronome. There, he put a metronome in front of this picture of a map of India. Uh, Wilson goes on, it was set so that each time it ticked back and forth, one person in the Indian subcontinent died who had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. This so affected Samuel Zwamer that at the end of the message, he rushed forward and signed the decision card, which stated, not a decision to b believe in Christ. He's, he's been a believer from his youth. He's rushing forward and saying, God help me. I will become a foreign missionary. So uh, imagine this picture, though. There's this man talking about the desperate need of missionaries in India and elsewhere, and he's got this metronome ticking back and forth. And so as you're listening to this man talk about the dire need of missionary labors, you're thinking, tick, 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 you know, died, died, died. How urgent uh, this would impress upon you the need for missionary work. Uh, if, if you have a heart for the Lord and a heart for the lost, well, this is exactly what happened in the case of Samuel Zwamer. Well, uh, the interesting thing is, though, that, that Zwamer, he didn't want to go just anywhere. There was stuff being done in India. There was stuff being done in China. Somehow it was put on his heart to go to the lands of Islam. These were known as the neglected land. Ever since the time of Raymond Lowell, a missionary in the 13th century, the, the Islamic lands had been largely neglected. And I don't think there's uh, much uh, curiosity why. As I said, hard nut to crack. Uh, Muslims have not responded well to missionaries in history. Now, not that other lands have just flown up, uh, thrown open their doors and said, come and, and evangelize us. But even in the midst of their persecution and so forth, uh, they haven't been as typically uh, and persistently and, you know, just all around uh, the board uh, hostile to the message. There, uh, there, there's been, uh, even in the midst of persecution, there's great response uh, in China, in India and other places. So you, you see a lot of fruit coming from it. Well, uh, all the missionary labors in the lands of Islam had proven pretty uh, fruitless for the most part. And so people just kind of gave it up after Raymond Lowell. Well, Zwamer looked at this and he thought, nothing doing. That's not an impossible nut to crack. Lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world, Jesus said. Zwamer had this in his mind and Zwamer said, I'll go. And uh, the interesting thing is at the time, there were uh, usually when people would be sent out on missions, they had to go through a missions board. So the churches had these missions boards that were responsible for looking at the, the work that was to be done, sort of surveying the situation, uh, evaluating the man who would do it, evaluating their resources, how they could support this. Uh, and, and so they would assess the situation and decide if they were going to send uh, a, this person. Well, at, at the time, nobody wanted to send people to the lands of Islam. And so Zwamer and uh, other people that were uh, in agreement with Zwamer about doing this, like um, uh, Canteen and, and Spear and others, uh, they, they met with uh, opposition uh, on the part of missions boards. And uh, so this is like the first discouragement, if you will. Now, I'm not suggesting that Zwamer himself was inwardly discouraged. I don't know any evidence of that. But I mean, outwardly, this is certainly the first occasion for him being discouraged. He wants to go to this land. The Lord has burdened him with this. And, and here he is receiving no support from church missions board. 
uh, the church missions boards. Well, here's what Zwamer said. This, this shows you the, the zeal of the man and the confidence of the man in God's overarching sovereignty. He said, if God calls you and no board will send you, then bore a hole through the board and go anyway. So, so this shows you something of the spirit of the man. If God calls you, then you go, no matter who fails to support you in it. Now, happily, as Zwamer uh, showed himself to be tireless in these efforts, uh, eventually missions boards caught up with him. And uh, But be before the missions boards did, Zwamer and others had to go around to individual churches and raise support for themselves. Uh, so I, I feel them because I, I do uh, labor among prisoners, and uh, that means I have to go to, to churches and get them to support the work. Otherwise, uh, I can't eat. My family can't eat. So uh, I know what it's like to go to individual churches. Well, uh, at Zwamer's time, it was the board that would normally decide this. And so having to go to the individual churches was, was not the ordinary uh, way of doing things. But anyways, he, he, he does this. They raise up uh, a support and they go out. And while on the mission field, all sorts of difficult things happen. I'm not even going to be able to scratch the surface on this. But, you know, one of the things that happens, just to give you one little idea of this, is he eventually gets married to an Australian Christian missionary who is also at work on the mission field as a nurse. Uh, he, he marries a lady and they begin having children. And in 1904, while on the mission field in the Islamic world, uh, two of their children, two young daughters, died from malaria within weeks of each other. Uh, one was seven years old and the other was four. On, on the children's gravestone, Samuel and his wife, Amy, wrote the following words. So this is on the tombstones of their two daughters that they lost in infancy. Worthy is the lamb to receive riches. This, this, again, this shows you the undaunting confidence of these people in the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, they were racked by the, the loss of their children, but they knew they served a good Lord. They knew that they were doing uh, in, in the world what he had called them to. And, and they knew that the loss to them of their children was no loss to Christ and to his, his church. They'd see their children again. And uh, in fact, uh, years later, when, when uh, Zwamer looked back upon his, what well, I haven't mentioned yet, 50 years of missionary activity among Muslims, when he looked back upon those 50 years and all these things that happened to him in the course of it, he said, I'd do it all over again. I'd do it all over again in a heartbeat. Uh, well, uh, I gave you one example of some of the hardship they faced. Uh, here, here's something else. Uh, this is actually written by uh, Robert Kaplan. He was a non-Christian. So it's uh, interesting to read what he wrote about uh, Zwamer. This is in his book called The Erebus. Speaking of Zwamer and James Canteen, somebody that partnered with Zwamer for a good portion of his, his missionary activity, he said, Zwamer and Canteen were true outsiders of the Middle East missionary movement as it gathered steam at the turn of the 19th century. Neither was a New England wasp or an Ivy Leaguer. Zwamer and Canteen were true believers. Remember, this guy's a non-Christian. They were true believers, pioneers, and soldiers of God, if ever any ever existed in the world. These hardy preachers tramped back and forth, up and down the yawning trapezoidal shores of Arabia, from Mesopotamia, Baghdad, down the reedy, down the reedy mosquitoed waters of the Tigris to Basra, the legendary home of Sinbad the sailor at the top of the Arabian Gulf, from Kuwait and the other sheikdoms down to Muscat and around the Gulf of Oman to Aden near the mouth of the Red Sea. In these sweaty, lice-infested ports and villages, Zwamer and Canteen spent many a night reading Hebrew scriptures in Arabic by the dim candlelight amidst all the baggage and beasts of an Oriental inn. Sleeping in barges, inhabiting dirt-floored rooms in mud-brick hovels, sick most of the time, the pair lived like down-and-out hippies, suffused with happiness for weeks on end whenever they managed to convince an Arab to accept a copy of scripture and take it home with him. 
Through all the years of daily failure, the first chapter of Joshua always sustained them. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, to you I have given it. So uh, that, that gives you something of a picture of what Zwemer endured and some of the others that were with him, including his wife and, uh, and his children. Uh, it, it was an incredible, uh, onerous task, as I've said, the, uh, but, but he, he bore it all with joy. And, and like this quote said, uh, he was overjoyed no matter how many weeks he would spend sick, uh, down and out. If he could get one Arab to take a copy of the Bible, it was enough to fill his heart with joy for weeks on end. So, so this shows you something of the uh, the missionary labors of Zwemer. Now, I'm about to tell you something remarkable, and you'll begin to see, if you haven't already, why he's called the Apostle to Islam, why he's such a towering figure. So I said that Zwemer decided to become a missionary in 1887 when Robert Wilbur Wilder uh, came and spoke to him. He's noting things about this in his journal in 1888. He, he tells his mother, by the way, that he's decided to become a missionary. And I, I love this. That uh, When he told that to his mother, his mother said, when you were born and I placed you in the cradle, I consecrated you to God. And I said, Lord, please make him a missionary. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So his mother prayed for him while she was putting him in the cradle for the first time. I, she, he didn't apparently know that until he tells her that he wants to be a missionary after hearing Robert Wilder, and and then she told him. Well, uh, he, he, while he's out on the mission field, he's doing this for 50 years, he wrote a book a year on Christianity, the message of the gospel to Muslims, Islamic customs, Islamic errors, all sorts of things re relevant to missionary work and everything else, a book a year. So he wrote 50 plus books in his lifetime. He also eventually taught at Princeton Seminary about missions. But during that time, during the time that he was a missionary in all these Islamic places, Bahrain, Cairo, Egypt, all over the Islamic world, he would make these constant trips to America constant trips to America where he would speak at churches, speak at conferences, speak at missionary events, telling them about the need for missions, missions in general, missions to Muslims in particular. He, he labored tirelessly. He didn't come here and rest. He continued his labors right when you'd expect him, you know, coming from the, the malaria infested worlds uh, that he was inhabiting, the, the floors that he was sleeping on. He'd come here, he'd hit the ground running and continue to, to labor uh, here and not simply bask in the in the comfort that America offered. He, he tirelessly tried to stir up people to go over there and do this. Well, so here's the thing. This will sound depressing for a moment. For all of Samuel Zwemer's efforts in the Islamic world for 50 years, the number of people reported to have come to Christ as a result of his preaching, catch this, 50 years. His daughters died during this time. His brother died as well, by the way. Living in terrible conditions. For all of his labors, 50 years, only 12 or so people are reported to have come to Christ through his witness. How does a man keep up his witness for Christ in such circumstances? You have to be thinking, did, did the Lord call me to this? Is this something that I was really called to do? There seems to be little fruit of it. But, but Zwemer was a man convinced of his calling, and it never occurred to him that Christ didn't call him. It never occurred to him for any lasting amount of time. Zwemer worked tirelessly at great cost to himself. Well, now here's the remarkable thing. For all that, though Zamer labored for 50 years at great loss to himself and only saw about a dozen people come to Christ, remember that Zwemer kept coming here and talking about Christ, and he was writing these books. Well, one of the things that this did 
is it sparked a flurry of missionary activity that was of seismic proportions. People began to flood onto the mission field. They began to flood into Islamic lands. So that even though individuals didn't come through the works of uh, the direct preaching of Zwemer, multiplied thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands have come to Christ because of Zwemer. His works followed after him. He, he was a man that inspired people to go do this. People seeing Zwemer do this in the face of such incredible opposition and tirelessly and fearlessly and with courage, they were so moved to do this that they began to pour out onto the mission field. And so even though Zwemer did not directly see this happening in his lifetime, people coming to Christ through his witness, that is in fact what God did through Zwemer. So th that gives you something uh, of an idea of, of just what a, uh, a giant uh, Zwemer was. Now, this is but an introduction. You can already tell that there's much more that can be said about Zwemer. What I want to do following this intro in subsequent lessons is look at some of the principal works of Zwemer, because Zwemer is one of the greatest authorities on popular Islam, meaning one of the greatest authorities on what Muslims actually believe and, and how they actually live and, and so forth in, in various places in the Islamic world. Islam is not a monolith. Islam is variegated. Uh, there's been uh, diversification within their midst. You know, they're, they're just as uh, factionalized as Rome in the East, right? Rome in the East pretend to be unified, but everybody that's read a little bit knows that's a hoot. That's a lie. Islam is a very fractured religion. And Zwemer was a man who knew these differences by experience. He was a man on the ground. He lived among Muslims. So he knew the things that were common to Muslims. He knew things that were different from this group to that group. He, he knew something of their superstitions and all that. So I want to look at some of his works and see what we can glean from them. Uh, some of these works talk about simply Christian truths that we need to talk to Muslims about. Others talk about Islamic beliefs. Uh, and others talk about evangelism and the importance of prayer and, and all of this. So uh, we'll look at some of these works, like um, some of my favorites would be, or, or Zwemer's favorites, in fact, The Glory of the Manger, which is about the incarnation, The Glory of the Cross, self-explanatory. Another is the, the uh, about the glory of uh, Christ's resurrection. So uh, there are a lot of good works that we will have an opportunity to look at in subsequent weeks. But don't lose sight of the main point of all this. The main point of all this is not to know something about a man named Samuel Zwemer, though there, there's value in that. He's a, a man of God, right? Not, not just God's man, but a man of God. Remember um, Alexander the Great, a pagan, uh, somebody once said of Alexander, he's He's God's man, but not a man of God. And what they meant was he was a man that God was using, though he didn't know it. He wasn't a man of God. He, did, he didn't believe in God or follow him, but he was used by God, like Cyrus, the pagan. God used Cyrus without Cyrus understanding it. Well, Zwemer was not only God's man, he was a man of God. And so he's, he's an example to us, not just a... A historical figure that we'll one day meet. He was He's an inspiring example of missionary activity. And so let us keep that in mind as we continue to think about Zwemer and look, about, uh, look at Zwemer in subsequent lessons. So I will conclude there with that. And here is George Saig. And you're muted. Usual. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> This is awesome. Uh, he has so many books, right? Uh, where can we find these books? So you can go to the Samuel Zwemer Center uh, online, but there's also on, on the Answering Islam website. Uh, so I should say, so there's so many books. Some are still in publication. They're, they're still being published. Like they're, they're still out there as books. You could buy them. 
but some of them are also online, even if they're not still being published. You can find some at Answering Islam. If you go to, in the left column on Answering Islam, it, it'll have a selection that says individual authors. And if you go down to the bottom of that, as I recall, it'll say uh, older, older authors. And there you'll find things by older Christians, including Zwamer. So you'll find a number of things there, but you can also find stuff uh, at the, um, I'm trying to think, is it Samuel Zwamer Center? Yeah, the, it's the ZwamerCenter.com. ZwamerCenter.com. Uh, there they have works by Zwamer. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I don't know if anyone left a question. I am trying to see. That's okay. They were inspired rather than uh, provoked. You know, the questions did not arise in their mind. It was more, how can I be of service to Christ like Zwamer? <laughs> That's awesome. We always do, brother. Uh, when we listen to you and we're learning so much from you. Um, now, uh, are you doing any debate soon? Uh oh. No. Any um, debate soon? Well, I haven't announced it on my channel, but there's no, there's no set date here yet. But I'm supposed to debate Roman Catholic Robert Genis. That'll probably okay. be next year. We're going to be debating justification. So some people might remember that there was a kerfluffle a couple of years ago, uh, an apostate from the gospel that used to work with us. In fact, uh, he, he decided that Christ wasn't sufficient. He needed the merits of others and, and his own works and so forth. So he, he abandoned the gospel for that. And uh, he decided to start attacking some of us. And and at that time, I began to defend the gospel against those attacks. And I was supposed to debate his stand-in because he didn't think he was adequate to the task. He, he chose a stand-in to debate for him. But that guy kept uh, changing his mind, saying he got something came up, he couldn't do it. And that went on for like a year. And I was saying during that whole time, neither of these men are the best representatives for the false gospel of Rome. I said, really, the person that ought to be doing it is somebody like Robert Genis. Robert Genis wrote a big, thick book on justification against the gospel of justification. And uh, it, it's one, it was one of the uh, foremost works on justification from a Roman Catholic perspective in almost a century, that, as far as I can tell. And uh, so uh, he's really the guy that should be doing it, not those other guys that were pretending for a moment that they would do it. Right. So anyways. I thought Robertson Genis wasn't going to debate me on the topic because I had seen him say in the aftermath of some of this, he'd said he's he's getting past his period of debating. like He doesn't think he's going to debate anymore. Uh, but next thing I knew, he was doing debates. And I'm like, what happened? And, and I think maybe his health had improved. I think maybe he had a little lull in his health and thought maybe he was winding down, but then his health sprang back. That's how it appears to me. Anyways, he's been doing a bunch of debates. And so uh, somebody mentioned the possibility to me and I said, yeah, if you can get him to debate me on this, then let's do it. So St. Genis and I will eventually, Lord willing, be debating uh, the gospel. That's awesome. I would love to see that. Uh, maybe we can make it part of the conference that we've been doing every year on the Catholic Church. Uh, hmm. This would be really awesome to uh, start the conference with a debate like that. Uh, I, I've been approaching uh, Shabir Ali and uh, and also, uh, I don't know how many of you remember, CL. Uh, he's supposed I, to came to Pride and then left. Uh, we asking him to debate. Uh, in the past, I asked him and he saying, no, he would not debate. But uh, I'm hoping now he would be open more to debate. You know, it's interesting as I, I mean, it's not overly interesting but a little i i was driving home from church today and i thought maybe i'll listen to something on zwamer you know i, I thought uh, why not uh stir me up or whatever but um the first thing that i found was uh, a thing by cl on 
Zwamer. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it, it's funny. So I didn't end up listening to anything good on Zwamer. I just, I heard CL Edwards, but uh, it was kind of funny because, you know, even though he was reading something from Zwamer, he didn't reflect a great deal of awareness of, of what he was now, reading. He was reading it when he was supposed to be Christian or no, a as a Muslim. So it was it was more recent it, since his uh, flight to Islam. Um, he, he, uh, so, yeah, he I guess he was just looking for something to make content on. So he, he did this short video on Zwamer. And the, the, the funny thing is, so it, the work uh, that he was reading used the word Muslim. And, and in, in his mind, so he says, he, he goes, that's Zwamer. Zwamer's calling them Muslims, you know, like, like Zwamer is the one that did that. But what he doesn't realize is, first of all, Zwamer was fluent in Arabic, right? Zwamer went over to the Arab world and learned Arabic. And he lived in the Arab world for 50 years. He knew Arabic. He read the Bible in Arabic, not, not only Hebrew and Greek and so forth. He knew the language through and through the, it's the translators of these works back in the you know, early 1900s that are transliterating some of these terms into English in a way that sounds strange to those who speak Arabic, right? We say Muslim, not Muslim. Uh, we say Muhammad, not uh, Mohammed or something like that, right? So uh, it, it's not a reflection on Zwamer that his writings say Muslim on them. That's a re reflection of the translators, you know. So, yes, CL was just stumbling all over the place. But by the way, the second oldest mosque in America is called Muslim. Oh, <laughs> that's <still> funny. <laughs> the Muslim Association. Uh, the second oldest mosque in America is in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, we're going to be there, Lord willing, on Thursday uh, for a discussion. Um, yeah, but uh, we have two questions. Uh, this is the first one. If you can read that out loud, please. Oh, um, I was looking at the chat. Okay, what tips do you have for people who want to spread the gospel while struggling with assurance of salvation? Okay, so first of all, one thing to always think about is who does the question of assurance nag at, right? Who is it that's bothered by this question? Is your lost next door neighbor who doesn't read the Bible, doesn't go to church, spends his time at the bar, is that person struggling, rolling over in his bed, worried about his salvation, worried about whether his faith is genuine, worthy about, you know, th that sort of thing? No, he, he, he doesn't have a care in the world along those lines. He might have moments where he's afraid of death or something like that, but that's not a struggle with assurance of salvation. The only people that are struggling with this sort of question are those who have a concern for their own souls, those who are mindful of Christ and, and, and the things of God. So the very fact that people, anybody asks this question and it bothers them, they ought to take some heart from that. That's a good sign. It's a good sign that you're wondering, do I have a saving knowledge of Christ? Am I united to him through faith? So, so that's the first thing. Uh, another thing to say about assurance is many people believe that the, the thing that they need to do most is look inwardly. They, they, they think that they need to look inside of themselves for assurance when when the bible directs us primarily to look outward M many christians have said of in, in connection with assurance that christ is the mirror of election okay what does that mean well i mean scripture uses the word election i'm not here getting into how we understand that term but it says, or, or this saying of Christians is that Christ is the mirror of election. Okay, what does that mean? Well, according to Scripture, we, we know that we are among those upon whom God has set his love if we believe in the Son. 
if we have faith in the Son. This is the fruit and proof of election. We know that we belong to that number that is his people, his sheep, his fold, his bride, his body. We know that we belong to that group of people if we have faith in the Son. That's where all of God's love is found. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The, the, the saying there, the, the grammar indicates that God's love reposes in Christ. It, it, it's settled there. That's, that's where it has always been. And so if a person is in Christ, then they're a recipient, a beneficiary of that love. Now, saying this, doesn't mean that there's no relevance, no place to bring in a consideration of our thoughts, our actions, our our works, our fruit. It's simply to say that the primary grounds of our assurance is, do we believe in Christ? That's the basis of our confidence that we're forgiven before God, the basis of our confidence that we're accepted as righteous and loved. But it is true that that reality has an impact on us. That reality will have an impact on us, right? Even if Scripture never exhorted us to any good works, which it does, I, you know, it, it seems most natural that a person who's come to believe in the Father through the Son, who's come to know in Him the forgiveness of sins, would be overjoyed about that and want to tell other people, right? That seems to me natural, right? What do you do if somebody rescues you from a terrible disaster? Do you immediately start mistreating them, or do you think? I ought to be abundantly gracious to this individual. Uh, I, I, I owe my life to this individual. Well, that, that's just a most natural thing. And, and so just spontaneously, it would seem this sort of thing uh, should well up within us. But, but Scripture does exhort us to this, and it, it tells us certain things that ought to mark believers. It tells us that the book of 1 John was written for this end. The book of 1 John was written so that we may know that we have eternal life. So, well, John's gospel was written to, to assure us that we have life in the Son, but his first epistle was written to assure us that our faith is genuine, so give us assurance that our, our faith is in him, and so that through him we have life. And so what sorts of things does John talk about? Well, he talks about having correct belief about Christ, if people believe rightly in Christ, that he's become incarnate, that he's been manifested among us. He was with the Father. He's been manifested to us. Uh, if people believe he's come in the flesh, uh, these sorts of things, that, that orthodoxy is a testimony to their the genuineness of their faith. He says that a person who has true faith will be marked by a love for the brethren. He'll love other believers. He won't be characterized by hatred and hostility towards fellow Christians, not to mention fellow image bearers. Uh, he will be uh, somebody who seeks to serve Christ, walks in the light, keeps his commandments. But at the same time, and here's why it's important to begin with looking to Christ as the foundation ultimately of this, and not simply to the, the fruits, uh, even though those play a role. Even within all of this talk where John talks about these good works, John says that the believer can sin. And, and what marks a believer then is not sinlessness. That, that shouldn't be an occasion to, to doubt your salvation. What would be an occasion to doubt your salvation is if you don't have this other mark that John talks about, which is confession of sin when you sin. Paul says, if any man says he's without sin, he's a liar. The truth isn't in him. So sin doesn't disprove your, your being in Christ. It's failure to confess it. He says, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So sin is not a disproof of our belonging to Christ. The failure to repent of it and, and ask for cleansing is. So this is how the Bible communicates assurance to us in, in these ways foundationally looking to Christ, but then also in a secondary way, recognizing that there are certain fruits of, of his grace in our lives, uh, tempered by this observation that they're not sinless lives. Um, now, how does this connect with uh, preaching the gospel? Well, for one, I would say that the more you gain confidence in this, uh, the more exuberant you're going to be in your evangelism. So there's there's something of a cart and horse thing here. 
at the same time, I wouldn't say that you should wait until you have this well-founded assurance before you witness of Christ. Sometimes it's through these means that God works assurance in us, right? This can be the very thing that God uses to, to encourage you. Uh, I have no greater moments of joy in my life than when I'm telling others about Christ. And so I'm most mindful of Christ being at work in me when I'm being used of Christ. And so uh, even though there's a sense in which greater assurance will give greater exuberance, as I've said, to your evangelism, you still should be engaging in evangelism, knowing that that, too, is a, a means God can use to uh, increase your, your confidence and, and so forth. And it's sort of like the um, I remember a, a teacher of mine once saying, you know, um, you, you, you don't, um, how did he put it? Um, gosh, I just said, I remember my teacher saying once, and now I'm forgetting what he said, <laughs> trying to remember the exact wording, but the, uh, the, the idea was basically you don't want to sin twice. Right. So, so let's say you say, I don't feel like witnessing. Should you witness? He says, yes. Right. Because you should feel like witnessing. And you should witness. But if you don't feel like witnessing, that's not an excuse not to witness, right? Then you'd be sinning twice by not feeling like it and by not witnessing, right? So uh, the idea is we should always be obedient, even in the midst of disobedience, though we should always be seeking to be thoroughly obedient and not only partially so. Amen. Okay, another question. Hmm. I forgot you wanted me to read these. So Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. Job is also described as a good man. What's the difference if a Muslim asks me to explain? Okay, so we use the word good in our own context in a variety of ways. Uh, I, I, I often think about how strange it is that people fall apart when, when they read the Bible, but they don't in ordinary discourse. And I don't just mean, you know, uh, the questioner here, but I mean myself and others. Often, you know, you see this word used in the Bible and suddenly it's like we forget how how words can have different shades of meaning, different nuance. The, the, there's a range of things that come within the scope of a word. Well, just think of how the English word good is used. Right. If I say I got this really good knife the other day. Well, what I mean by a good knife in this context is it is a effective tool for cutting things. I'm not making a moral judgment about the knife. I'm not saying the knife lives uprightly before God. It doesn't violate the Ten Commandments. It loves God and neighbor. Right. That's not what I'm saying when I say it's a good knife or if I talk about a good car uh, or, or something like that. The word good is being used differently. Well, it's also true that we can use words in, in relative ways or in more absolute ways. Uh, if I say that, uh, it, well, if the author of scripture says that Job was a good man, we know that doesn't mean absolutely good, number one, because as Jesus said, only God is good in that sense. He means it in the absolute sense. And, and how do I know that? Well, if you look at Job, what is Job doing in the first two chapters, among other things? He's offering sacrifices. Part of what defines Job as a righteous man is the fact that he was mindful of sin, his own and that of his children. And so he would offer sacrifices. Why do you offer sacrifices? Because you're a sinner, right? So Job was a righteous man because he knew that he wasn't perfect. That he, he knew he needed a savior. And how do people address this under the old covenant? They make sacrifices. They repent towards God and so forth. So. Job's goodness is not absolute, though it, it was a real uh, a real goodness, it, it, because there's another sense in which we can distinguish. I, I can call my non-believing next-door neighbor good in a civic sense, but not in a spiritual sense. But what do I mean by that? Well, in a civic sense, I just mean in the sense of uh, society, civil society. 
he might be a good guy to live next door to. He, he, he'll he help me if I have a problem. If one of my pipes burst, he'll help me fix it. Uh, he's not going to steal my car, right? I, I, I can count on my neighbor like that, even though he's not a believer. Uh, not everybody's like that. There could be other neighbors you wouldn't want to have. Uh, but my neighbor, for all that, if he's not a believer, is not spiritually good. He, in order for someone to be spiritually good or for their actions to be good, it needs to have certain things to be you know, true of it. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the good work needs to proceed from a good heart, from a clean heart. Remember, Jesus said, a bad tree can't bear bad fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. And he says, in order for a, a bad tree to bear good fruit, the tree must first be made good. He, he's talking about the heart. You have to go to the root of the matter, address the heart. Once the heart is good, then it can produce good fruit. Out of the heart, Jesus said, come evil thoughts, adulteries, and all these things, right? So the heart has to be made good in order for good things to come out of it. So as good as my next door neighbor might be in his outward actions compared to others, before God, he's not good. He's not spiritually good because they don't proceed from a born-again heart. Moreover, a good work to be good has to proceed from the right motive. It has to be done in faith. Paul said, whatever is not done in faith is sin. It has to be done according to God's standard, not just because somebody thinks there's some other standard uh, that he's to live up to. It has to be the standard God gave. And fourth, it has to be done for the glory of God. That has to be its, its goal. When unbelievers do good things, they're not thinking of God, not the true God, and so forth. So the word good can be used in different ways. It can be used of civic righteousness. It can be used of spiritual uh, goodness. It can be used in a relative way. It can be used in an absolute way. When Jesus said nobody's good but God alone, in that context, it's obvious what's going on there. The man call, comes up and calls Jesus good teacher in the context of asking him, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? In, in this context, the relevant thing to, to point out to the man is, if you're thinking of achieving what's necessary before God, the, the goodness necessary, well, then we're talking about absolute goodness here, right? And in that sense, nobody's good but God alone. Now, when you read the whole context, it's clear that, that Jesus is also directing the man to think more deeply about who he is, who Jesus is, because eventually the man realizes with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. G Jesus eventually tells the man that the only way he can have the goodness he needs, he needs to become Christ's follower. right? So Christ is putting himself in the place of God there. That's a longer study, but the, the, the basic point, though, relevant to your question is that, that Jesus is saying that God is absolutely good. And these other texts that you see fall into other categories of goodness. Jo Job was good in a relative sense. He was spiritually alive, did good things, but not sinless like God. And, and his, whatever goodness he had was derived, not independent. Amen. I think that's it for questions. Uh, then next month, you're going to continue... Uh, the same subject, uh, more into the life of Samuel Zwemer. Well, uh, uh, yeah. what I'll probably do is, I mean, I want to look at books of Zwemer. So the idea will be, like he has a book called The, the Muslim Doctrine of God. So he's going to talk about what they teach about Allah. And we'll look at that, and that'll be an occasion to make other points maybe that Zwemer doesn't make. It's, it's going to be like a catalyst for, for other comments and stuff. Awesome, awesome. And then, and then other works after that. That's awesome. Uh, remember, guys, if you can pray for us, uh, the 23rd of this month till the 28th, we'll be uh, having training on conference and uh, uh, going to the mosque and also having door-to-door -door outreach a few weeks ago. We were in the same area here in Detroit. We reached uh, around 1,700 homes within a few days, and we're going to be doing the same uh, this time. And um, also, we're going to be at the festival next weekend, uh, Arabic Kaldani Festival. Uh, thousands of uh, Arabs will be there. A good number of Muslims will be there. Uh, and uh, we have former Muslims with us and uh, others at the festival and as we share in the gospel one-on-one -on -one with Muslims, uh, please uh, keep us in your prayers. And don't forget uh, to sign up for our Strong Tower California. Uh, 
you have less than a week uh, the tickets gonna go from thirty dollars to eighty dollars um, you have to get your tickets as soon as possible right now we have 70 percent off which make it thirty dollars uh, then in August, beginning of August, going to be twenty percent off, making it eighty dollars. But at the door will be a hundred dollars. Uh, we're going to have some of the best speakers. We have uh, some new speakers that you did not meet before, but uh, like Kamal Fahmi, uh, I know him for almost uh, thirty-eight years. Wonderful man of God, got used to reach hundreds of thousands of Muslims across the Middle East and in Sudan. Um, also, we're having a brother from Nigeria. He's not in the list. Uh, he is a great apologist. Uh, I don't know if uh, I'm sure a lot of you know Season Apologetics. Uh, he is the leader of that uh, web uh, YouTube channel. Uh, wonderful brother in the Lord. He will be with us in person. Uh, Al Fadi will be with us in person. Anthony will be with us in person. Uh, uh, I'm sure that's good enough, guys. If Anthony is there, he should be there. Uh, Dr. J. Smith, uh, Dan Baker coming again for the second time. Wow. Uh, Dr. Eddie Delcour. Uh, so far, I think Dr. Eddie is the longest uh, a person that spoke at the uh, And uh, also, Samuel Green will be joining us online. And we have uh, one speaker is. His face is not shown because it is very, very important to not tell you who that person is. Um, but also we have uh, Pastor James Cadiz. He's a radio show host. He's going to be leading the panel discussions. It's going to be really exciting panel discussions. Uh, not uh, Usually we deal with one on evangelism, one on apologetics, one on polemics. Uh, but this time it's going to be very, very uh, different and exciting we would love to see you with us please don't forget to sign up as soon as possible before it's too late we'd love to see you with us if you're coming out of the state and if you are born again christian and you're coming to the conference let us know we would love to arrange a place for you to stay as well uh reverend anthony thank you so much brother and i'm looking forward to see you tomorrow lord well, you're coming tomorrow right well i'm Starting my drive tomorrow, I probably won't get there till early Tuesday. How okay. early are you going to be there? Uh, I'm going to be there early tomorrow because I have a lot of preparations to do. Oh, but, oh so you're already there. So um, yeah. I'm just I'm just saying because I know I'll be there before the time you told me to be there. I just yeah. wondered. Uh, I don't know exactly what time I'll get there. Cause, yeah, uh, if you it's four o'clock, we're going to have the guest speakers. We will have dinner and fellowship together with the local pastors, but. Uh, if you come before that, just let me know, and uh, we will, I will let you know where I am, and we can catch up there. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And Lord willing, we see you next week with Sa in M2M Network channel with Samuel Green. Uh, I think he continue chapter 9 of the Quran. We've been going verse by verse the entire chapter, uh, Surah 9 of the Quran. Thank you so much, guys. God bless you and uh, see you soon.